Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Depends upon where you are in this world. Uh, I am uh, in the world of firefighting is where I'm at. <laughs> Bill Gustin from Miami Dade Fire Rescue, uh, Captain, and I've got some. Uh, I got. We have a distinguished guest with us today, along with our regular panel members. I hope everybody is in the pre-holiday cheer. Uh, I know that I will be this evening. So uh, I want to thank our sponsor, Key. That's keyhose.com. I now work in the training division. If you want to put hose to the test, put it in the hands of the training division because it'll be pulled across asphalt all day over windowsills. Every grade of key hose has amazing heat and abrasion resistance. And they're combat ready and true ID hose has amazing kink resistance. So. It's a hearty endorsement for me. Yes, they, they sponsor us. Sure, sure they do. But it's fortunate for me that I do use the hose and I'm a true believer in it. Uh, Captain, Captain Mike, you introduce yourself, sir. Mike Dugan, Merry Christmas. Damn glad to be here. Clark. Uh, good morning. Everybody, Clark Lamping, Captain Clark County Fire Department. Had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Looking forward to a good holiday season and looking forward to this conversation. Daryl. How are you guys doing? Daryl Liggins, Oakland Fire Department. Uh, I'm having good holidays. Uh, you know, looking forward to this discussion. I think it's, it's uh, real timely in the world of firefighting. We're going to have Chief Danny Sheridan on the webcast today to hang out and unfortunately his brother passed away uh, but in his absence he is actually the motivation for our focus today which is is the concept of protect and shelter in place protect shelter in place really practical in a post 911 post Grenfell tire a fire tower fire in in London uh, can we really encourage people to stay within the refuge or sanctity of their smoke-free apartment, or are they going to evacuate whether they are physically capable of doing it or not? I want to refer to some articles, and this is where, again, this is where the motiva motivation came from. Uh, Danny has two articles that are available on the fire engineering web. I believe Bill Carey is going to have it posted or accompany this uh, hangout. Uh, firefighting lessons and lessons learned. And um, the other one is the um, the fire on fireproof multiple dwellings. Again, both by um, uh, Danny Sheraton. Uh, kind of relevant that within the last week, uh, Washington D.C. had a fire on the 11th floor. Uh, it was mentioned in the Fire Engineering Web and also Fire Firefighter Nation. And the title of that was. Um, Firefighters, uh, shelter in place at DC high rise fire. Now, what a novel idea. Fire was on the 11th floor, and the firefighters uh, confined the fire to the fire compartment on the 11th floor and encouraged the occupants to remain in their relatively smoke free apartments rather than go out into a smoky hallway. So, that's basically our motivation for today. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a theoretical world, in an ideal world, we would be able to use the voice command system of a fire department panel, fire department alarm panel, and advise occupants to either stay in place, to relocate to a lower floor, seldom is a complete evacuation necessary, or to just stay in their apartments. Uh, unfortunately, what we find in Miami-Dade County is that even with the physically impaired, they get frightened, they panic, panic is contagious. They leave the refuge of a re relatively smoke-free fire compartment, that's an apartment or a uh, condominium unit. And we find them either unconscious or calling for help in a smoky elevator lobby, desperately pressing a button for an elevator that ain't coming. And we've been having quite a difficulty. Uh, the other thing that is working against us in other fire departments, and I'm going to ask uh, Captain Mike to uh, 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 
give his opinion on this. You know, what good is a fire alarm system that goes off throughout the whole building and it says, there is a fire in this building. Evacuate the building. Do not use the elevator. Is that what we really want? Before the fire department has gotten there and made an assessment so we can give these people some intelligent advice. Uh, Mike, uh, I know that you have some uh, a great amount of background with, with high rises, and you're going to be our uh, our subject matter expert on all things New York. So, Captain Mike, if you could voice your opinion on pre-recorded announcements and the practicality of a protect in, uh, shelter in place, both for residential and commercial buildings, Mike. Go ahead. Well, I think it's very big, Bill. First off, the um, pre-recorded messages don't work because they don't go to the people who need them. Once an alarm system is in, New York City, is it's illegal to use pre-recorded messages in the city of New York. Can't do it, okay? What has to happen is if you put the alarm system in, it has to come up to code, and by code, you have to have the people who can run the alarm system. Uh, in a shelter, it's gonna be a certificate of fitness as an F80. It might be an S95 certificate of fitness holder for an alarm system if they don't need a fire and life safety director. If they need a fire and life safety director, they have to have a fire and life safety director certificate of fitness. They have to pass a class 31 hours in a school in New York City. Then they have to go down to Metro Tech and take a test. And then they have to pass an on site in their building. And it's usually about five hours where they go over the alarms, the elevators, the communications. The announcements. Anybody running the alarm system has to know how to use it. It can't be like all of a sudden you hear the alarm going off and somebody looks and says, what's that noise? Okay. Once you put the alarm system in, you have to have someone who knows how to do it and address it. Where is the alarm going off for? If there's nobody in the building who knows what's going on, what floor it's on, can make selective announcements, then it's really, we're doing a disservice to the public. So I think the alarm systems, if they're in and to code, there has to be the proper people to man those alarm systems anytime the building is occupied. Now, the second thing on that is sheltering in place. Um, I have some pictures that I use in some of my teaching about a fire we had in Brooklyn where the woman in the apartment next door slept through the fire. Okay? Slept through it. Her apartment was clear as a bell. The door, the, um, the peephole in the door, the metal, expanded and then shrunk back a little bit and you can see the marking on the door you couldn't read the apartment letter on the door she opened up the door about two hours after the start of the fire and was like what's going on here okay slept through it great shots i have this was a really bad fire so i think that sheltering in place works in compartmentized areas if you have a commercial space and there isn't compartmentation, there isn't 2,500 square feet, 3,000 square feet of compartmentation, then sheltering in place is not going to work. And it also depends, very honestly, on the building's auxiliary appliances, the sprinkler system. Is there a sprinkler system in place? Is there a, uh, any kind of fire extinguishing system in place? What kind of fire is it? Is it a stove fire, a kitchen fire? Are the grease ducts properly taken care of? All of these things come into play in this, Bill. And I think it's really tough to put a system in and then just leave it there. And then no one knows what the hell it, it's there for. And, you know, the residents hear it go off and they think the world's coming to an end and they've got to leave. And they go into the, the staircases or whatever else. You can look at stories in the city of New York. I can give you two. I can give you three, really. but. The Strand was the, uh, that's down by Rescue One's quarters on um, 500 West 43rd Street, I think is the address. Um, and it was a, it's a high rise building. And it was a young couple, a gay couple that went into the stairs. The two guys got into the stairs. The fire was like 10 floors below their apartment. Because it was Christmas time, the, right around this time of year, the decorations to the fire apartment fell and blocked the door from closing, so the door was open. And then the stairwell door was broken on the fire floor, and they hadn't fixed it. 
the smoke got into the uh, staircase. It was like a natural chimney. It's this time of year. So it's warmer in the building, cold outside. It's a draft going up the stairs. And the uh, they were floors above the fire when they were overcome. One of them passed away. Then we have the case in New York City where the, the two police officers, Officer Dennis Guerra and Rosa Flores, went up in the elevator and they didn't know any better. They went to the fire floor. The elevator opened up on smoke. And because the elevator wasn't in fireman service and had the electric eye, they couldn't get the elevator doors to shut because it thought it would, there was an obstruction there from the, the smoke. And Officer Dennis Guerra passed away three days later from uh, hypoxia, uh, lack of oxygen from the smoke. And Officer Flores will be on um, oxygen probably the rest of her life. It was one twin size mattress. So these things, they happen all the time. You cannot beat smoke in today's fire environment with the chemicals in the smoke. So I think the problem is if we don't inform the occupants, they all think of the movies they've seen and they think the building's going to collapse. It don't happen. Captain Mike. Pose for occupant use in a cabin. Uh, it could be a class three system. In other words, you can't have two and a half inch outlets for the fire department. But it could be in a cabin at 10 feet, say, from the stairway. Maybe the outlets in an older building are not in the stairway. Would you comment on are they allowed, are they encouraged in New York City, and does the installation of a sprinkler system make a difference for occupant hose? Because you just said something that really resonates with me. You know, when I I used to ride with my dad years ago in Chicago, uh, they, you'd hear on the radio all the time, hold up the rest of the companies coming in here. It's just a mattress. You get a foam rubber mattress today, brother. You get a foam rubber mattress. You could kill every occupant of a fire compartment or on that floor. It is a big deal because it's solidified gasoline and it is nothing but a witch's brew of toxic chemicals. So, Mike, could I ask you about uh, What's your opinion and what is the city's opinion on occupant hose in New York City for both residential and commercial? Occupant hose, the problem with occupant hose, Bill, is nobody's ever, nobody inspects it. Nobody maintains it. It doesn't get pressure tested. I was in a building uh, probably a year and a half, maybe two years ago, doing an inspection of the building in New York City and found uh, occupant hose in a hose cabinet that was manufactured before I was out of high school, okay? It was manufactured in 1972, okay? That wouldn't have held a drop of water, okay? If you only used 50 feet, you wouldn't have gotten anything out of the nozzle at 50 feet because it would have gone everywhere. Ridiculous. We do not use occupant hose. And very honestly, do you really want the occupants trying to fight a fire? I think it's ridiculous. Absolutely. Absolutely not. No, it inter it, it, and it contributes to delayed alarms. Absolutely. Absolutely. Captain, do you think the presence of hose cabinets encourage residents to fight their own fire? I don't. I don't because most of these people um, do not. Um, most of these things do not encourage the people to fight the fire because in most of these buildings these occupants have never even seen the hose cabinet because they take the elevators to their apartment they go into their apartment and everything else and the staff is like yeah that's just there because we have to have it there i don't think that they want to fight the fire and i think it's kind of a silly thing and bill asked another question that i kind of want to address here is i think the uh, inclusion of a sprinkler system and it's got to be in all new high-rise buildings in the city of new york is the best thing you can do for anything i think it should be in residential i think it should be all over the place uh you should have a sprinkler um you know in your house protecting means of egress for your wife and your kids your husband and your kids your family whoever you live with it doesn't matter the people you love are sleeping upstairs protect the egress over the kitchen stove over the oil burner and anything that produces heat and over the dryer if you have a clothes dryer in your house. I think having those things is just something that we should push for. 
as the fire service. So I have a couple of points that uh, resonate with me and should resonate with all of our viewers. Uh, and that is the control of fire in a high rise building. You mentioned them both. You have to control the occupants. And you have to control the systems. And in order to control the systems, you have to pre fire plan. And in order to control the occupants, there has to be some kind of public education. And I think New York City is a model for that. Now we're going to we're going to take a look at another part of the country and we're going to see how they handle large crowds in um, resort hotels that may not be um, as competent as they should be for the obvious reasons. So I'm going to ask uh, Captain Clark uh, right from the Las Vegas Strip to explain what they do in their high rise resort hotels on the Miami Strip. Go ahead, Clark. Okay, thank you, sir. First of all, my hotels are not on the Miami Strip. We're on the Las Vegas Strip, but that's okay. Um, it's, that's going to be a hell of a long evacuation, let me tell you that. Um, so uh, typically what happens, uh, the building receives an alarm, and security goes and checks out that alarm before they notify the fire department, before they, um, before they evacuate anybody, security goes and checks out the alarm. Uh, once they confirm that it is a fire, we have smoke in the hallway, then they respond the fire department, it's situational on what the hotels do, what their policies are. And the policies, believe it or not, actually don't, do not involve the fire department. Because in Las Vegas, the hotels run Las Vegas. The hotel owners run Las Vegas. And what the hotel owners want, the hotel owners get. And we are typically second, third, or even fourth consideration when it comes to money. So it depend, it's dependent on what they want to do, how they handle it. Some of them have pre-recorded messages. Some of them choose to shelter in place. Some of them have uh, a system you can customize messages. There's a, a bank of all different messages you can deliver. So when we arrive, uh, you're typically notified on where the, where the uh, problem is. We send the first rescue to the fire command center, which will confirm uh, what we have. They'll be able to uh, tell us what kind of sprinklers are activated, how many smoke detectors are activated, and what location they are. Um, and they can also control the message of evacuation or shelter in place from the fire command center. But what happens before we get there, it's anybody's guess. And we have regularly showed up to thousands of guests evacuating hotels for a, a curling iron that fell into a wastebasket and started some tissues on fire. Um, and that has been controlled by the sprinklers. And we have a lobby full of people. Uh, we have the front of the hotel full of people. It's a mess. It's a mess. So we don't have a policy in Clark County that states of states shelter in place evacuate we, we don't have it we don't have it we need it but it takes again let me you have to understand yes we want it it's in everyone's best interest but do we want to fight that fight against these monster hotel company the guy the guy who owns the mgm hotel he has the governor's phone number personal cell number in his phone right anything we want he picks up the phone and calls the governor and says hey the fire department's messing with you and how does that work out for anybody we lose every time we lose every time any, any fire officer with any degree of responsibility uh, for their department understands that uh, we keep saying that we're not politicians. But in a sense, you have to be. Uh, I know that uh, with the public education programs in uh, New York City, uh, that the firefighters do uh, try to endear themselves to the public. And it's not just a matter of public relations, it's public education. So I think that's, that's really important. And uh, now we have one more uh, panelist. It's going to voice his uh, background and opinions uh, and experiences on the same thing. Protected place, pre-recorded announcements, and that would be our own Captain Daryl Liggins from uh, Oakland, California. Great. Take it away, Daryl. Uh, how are you guys doing? Um, well, uh, I have a couple of opinions, and, and uh, I'll tell a couple quick stories rolling back to the, the hose cabinets. They, they can be a blessing and they can be a curse. We do have hose in, in hose cabinets. Uh, uh, one one quick story was I did an inspection on an apartment building. You had no hose in the hose cabinet, so I have to do the inspection. I'm trying. To, I don't normally call the people directly, but I, I have the manager's phone number. I gave him a phone call, said, "Hey, trying to help you out. You need to have these things fixed, and you don't have hose in the hose cabinet." He said, "Hey, thanks. I'll take care of it." So we go do the reinspection. I think it's like three weeks later. There's no hose in the hose cabinet. 
have to write up the inspection. I, I uh, give him a call and he said, no, I, I did replace the hose. That is just there. It's not there. That's because we had a, a, a fire on the second floor. You had a fire on the second floor. I don't remember a fire. You know, normally we're passing on our fires. It's our first two, 27th or 28th Avenue. So we go, I look through the journal. I don't see anything we missed. We go back and sure enough, they had had a kitchen fire. Use that hose. He had ordered nude hose. The fire department never got called. He just had a burnt up kitchen. I was just in complete disbelief. But we had another fire. Actually, uh, Chief McGrail was in town giving us a class. I'm on the freeway. I see a column of smoke. I call him up. Hey, Chief, there's a, you know, there's a working fire up on uh, Brooklyn. And Jay Camella drives him over there and we're watching this fire. It's, it's, uh, it's roaring. The first new engine company saw a light smoke showing from the fourth floor. When they got in there, someone was on a hose cabinet line, not close enough to the fire to extinguish any, but just close enough to be blowing a lot of air into the apartment with this wide fog, blowing it into the apartment, accelerating the fire up into the, into the cock loft. And this fire ended up being uh, three, four alarms. And they, they said a big part of that was just blowing the air. So it could be a blessing and a curse. As far as uh, pre-recorded messages, in the city of Oakland, we don't use those pre-recorded messages. But sheltering in place, is it realistic? I don't think it's realistic to say we're going to get 100% of the people um, because we have every one of our cities here, everybody speaking all kinds of different languages. Okay, if I get on the mic, I can only speak one. Okay, the pre-recorded messages, they're not going to speak, uh, you know, maybe a couple of, of languages. But we have a lot of people that aren't going to believe what we say. They're not going to understand what we say. They're, uh, we have people that may be uh, deaf. And, but I do think if, if we're able to get to a percentage, even a large percentage of the people, it can be very, very helpful to give them some sort of announcement. Uh, with that said, uh, most of us aren't in very good practice of giving those announcements because there's just not a lot of these fires going around, even for the, the larger cities, or uh, especially you being uh, first do or lobby control or whatever. So I think it's uh, wise that when you get an alarm, I think it's disconcerting to anybody being in a building and seeing fire engines pull up and alarms going off, and you just have no idea what's going on. So a simple message of, you know, who you are, what you guys are investigating, and that they can stay in place. We're investigating a smoke detector on the 11th floor, a water flow. At this time, we have found no fire. You know, I'll keep you updated on that uh, PA. One, we could check, make sure the PA is working, and uh, and get a message out to the people. And you know, and then follow it up with a message once everything is uh, is wrapped up. I think uh, uh, using that announcement is really good. I was in a uh, hotel in the city of Reno, so another city. There's a lot of gambling, and and they didn't want to have, uh, you know, all the clubs empty out and all the casino empty out because, but they actually had a fire. I get up in the morning. I was there for a ski trip. I go to the elevator. As soon as I walk in the elevator, it's like that smells like structure fire. And somebody in the elevator said, "Oh yeah, they had a they had a fire in a in a room upstairs last night." So they did. They had no idea. I talked to a friend of mine there and it's just like, yeah, they just don't want to disrupt people that, you know, don't have to move or anything. So, you know, we slept right through it. Daryl, I want to give a shout out to my buddy, uh, Lieutenant Jimmy Davis from the Chicago Fire Department. I'm in the process of revising our um, Miami-Dade's high-rise procedure. I'm not, it's not there's, that's not a one-person job, but I'm kind of like project manager on it. Now, I have to tell you, if I have to read one more city's or regional fire high-rise procedure uh, or plan, uh, my head will explode like an M80 in a watermelon, okay? Because, <laughs> but Chicago, uh, when they arrive, uh, they have a fire investigation team, and it's going to be two companies, and there's a certain amount of uh, information that they will ascertain. Now, this does not take the place of lobby. But there are certain things they, in order to intelligently ascend, uh, either by stair or elevator, or stair and elevator, they need to know. And uh, Chicago makes that an initial announcement that they're there, they're investigating, and then periodically advising these people. 
uh, just silencing an alarm without uh, advising. There was never, there was never, a, a, there was either no, there was an emergency and it's over, or it never occurred. Um, I think what we're going to do right now is let's. It's uh, 25 after the hour. Uh, I want to mention our uh, our sponsor again, Key. That's uh, they can be reached at keypose.com. Uh, there's a lot of talk right now about um, alternatives to inch and three quarter and two and a half inch hose for standpipe operation. Uh, it used to be you really only had two choices, which is the inch and three quarter or the uh, the two and a half. Uh, but it's not just key; it's, it's the fire hose industry in in general. Uh, there are there have been developments where you can now get hose that uh, approximates the flow of a two and a half but uh, has the weight and the handling characteristics and the personnel uh, uh, requirements, number of people necessary to move and maneuver that hose closer to inch and three quarter. So don't think uh, that your choices are strictly two and a half or uh, inch, and three, inch and three quarter. Uh, if you're looking to replace uh, any of your fire attack packages, and when I say that, that means hose and nozzle combination, take a look at uh, the key true id 2.25 and 2.50 uh it's almost built like old school hose in the sense that it's got two separate jackets and a uh, a, a synthetic rubber lining uh, it does not increase uh, substantially in cross-sectional area so you basically have a true id hose i've had my hands on both the uh, 250 and 225 and uh, really like what I saw in terms of uh, maneuverability and kink resistance. So give that a shout. And if you wanted to try out a few uh, sections of that, contact uh, keyfire.com. Uh, now, I recently was recipient of somewhat of a, an Academy Award uh, for my participation in some action videos of a fire related nature. Um, and uh, it had to do, we were doing some free fire planning and uh, actually it has to do with occupant control too. So Joe, would you be able to uh, roll that video? We have two of them. Uh, I do believe that they're, they are entitled Crazy Old Man 1 and Crazy Old Man 2. Oh, there's Crazy Old Man 1. Can we play that? Ah, you see, there's compartmentation for you right there. Yep. See, it's banking down. Now. Remember, I'm old school, so I don't need any of that bunker gear or breathing apparatus or any of that. You know, I just get in there and fight it out with the red devil. So, Joe, I think, let me see here. Oh, there I am. Yep, yep, there I am at the stairwell. And uh, everything's under control, folks. Now, okay, good. Now, oh, yeah, no problem with me. No problem there. Now, as a result of these videos, I received somewhat of an Academy Award, kind of a an Oscar trophy, and here it is right here. I got this. It's my special award I got for my videos right here. Kind of consider it's kind of nice. It's, I don't know that it's pure gold, but it you know it's it's brass anyway. Anyway, it's gold colored. So uh, just a little memento from the Academy of uh, uh, Theater Arts and Sciences. I think that's what they call it. So yeah. Now we have our special guest today. And at the request of our boss, Chief Bobby Halton, when we were talking about protect in place and shelter in place, he wanted to mention elevators. You know, there would not be buildings without elevators, high rise buildings without elevators. To me, there should not be high rise buildings without sprinkler and standpipe systems and sprinkler systems. Now, because the shelter in place is not a practical matter, I think, in most cases. What Chief Halton encouraged us to look into and examine on this webcast, this, this hangout, is some of the developments that are uh, in uh, both in this country and in Europe, Israel. Am I asking right? Yes. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand the uh, uh, camera over. He's right here next to me now. And uh, to Captain Mike Posner, who's going to talk about some of these elevators uh, that are going to be used actually in fire conditions. So here you go, Captain Mike. Right. 
Uh, good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Hope this holiday season finds everybody healthy and well. Um, gonna, we're going to touch on a couple of different things. Um, everybody knows that when we have a high-rise fire, the elevators, everyone's told not to use the elevators. And as firefighters, we know that it's just a matter of time till water gets in the shaft and these elevators are rendered useless. And um, the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, a development. It's called fire service access elevators. And this is for firemen for when we arrive at the building and we want to use the building, the elevators, uh, put them in phase one and phase two. And um, anytime you have a building now, the newer buildings that are uh, 120 feet or higher above the lowest level of fire department access, uh, you're going to have fire service access elevators. Now, what's important to know about a FSAE is there will be no sprinklers in the machine rooms, machine spaces, hoistway, hoistway spaces. Um, so with no sprinklers, you are not going to run the risk of having this elevator going to a shunt trip, which is the reason we want to take that's the elevator that we as firefighters are going to want to be taking uh, when we're doing our job in the high rise fire. Uh, a couple of things about them. Um, they have to be 84 inches in size is for a stretcher. Uh, they have to have a 3,500 pound weight capacity inside the elevator, which is also a big one. We're putting guys in there and remember, don't ever overload an elevator uh, because if you guys have end up on a situation and the doors open, you need to have room for yourselves uh, to make sure you put all your gear on, protect gear on. Um, the elevator is identified by on the sides of the hoistway, there will be a fire helmet. It'll be three inches in height, and it's either a light colored fire helmet on a dark background or a dark helmet on a light background. And that's how we're going to know that that is uh, the elevator that we want to use for the fire service access elevator. Um, there has to also be a smoke enclosure to the elevator lobby, and there has to be an interior stairwell uh, to be able to be accessed from that lobby as well. What about the drain? Yes. So here we were talking about we can't have water get into the hoistway because that's what would cause the problems. Well, in order to do that, there has to be some form of an approved method that keeps water from getting into the elevator lobby and then going down into the hoistway. So there has to be uh, they usually put some form of a drain. And contrary to some uh, or earlier talk, the drain is not right in front of the elevator. The drain is actually at the entrance from the elevator lobby uh, in, into there. So the water is not even going to get into the elevator lobby. It has to, and we have to make sure that we can control that. Um, that's the elevator that we're going to want to use, the fire service access elevator. Now, the other one, since we're talking about protecting in place, and obviously uh, we know that we can't keep everybody in their building and they're going to just run out anyway, um, there is a new. Uh, started in Europe, uh, San Francisco is actually doing it uh, well, uh, occupant evacuation elevators, uh, OEEs or OEO, occupant evacuation operation. Uh, these are elevators that will be safe for the citizens to actually get in during a fire situation. Now, all citizens have been told, uh, don't ever take an elevator during a fire. So this is going to be a cultural change just in, in the general population as well. Um, so one of the first things is uh, these OEOs or OEEs, these are in buildings. Um, the International Building Committee uh, uh, has allowed buildings that are over 420 feet, instead of having an extra interior stairwell put in, they can put in these OEEs. Um, and some of the uh, qualifications for these is um, very similar to a fire service access elevator. There cannot be sprinklers in the hoistway machine room spaces, uh, et cetera. Uh, because again, we don't want to shunt trip with people using the elevator. Now, another thing that has to be done before they put these in, they have to have a very uh, in-depth plan in place. Uh, people are trained on site on how these are used because the citizens have to be uh, informed that you can use the elevators and how to do it. Now, um, these elevators have also some specifications like the FSAE. Uh, the way these are going to be identified is where you would call your elevator, the call button, 
it will be located there. It will be a, a, a sign that tells the occupants that this is an occupant evacuation elevator. These are programmed ahead of time. And for instance, if a fire is on the 17th floor, these elevators will automatically go to the 17th floor. The doors will open. People can start calling elevators from elsewhere, but it is programmed to respond to the fire floor. People will get in. It will sense when people are in it, and it also knows not to overload the elevator. So then the doors will close, and it takes them to the um, to the ground level. Captain Mike, I see you were. Did you have something to add, real quick? No, I'm loving it. You're calling okay. everything I know. Uh, the only thing I would add is in New York, the uh, occupant and the fire service elevator have to have a two hour fire rated enclosure. Okay. Ours has got to be two hours. And our occupant evacuation elevators have to have an iPad. Yes. That tell the people, and I'll let you go into your stuff. Yeah, there has to be signage. There has to be something there that allows the people to know. Uh, the direction the elevator is going in, what floor it's on, and how long it's going to take until that elevator is going to get back to them, which also they have to have an enclosed smoke-proof uh, lobby and an interior stairwell so that people, if they see that there's going to be too long of a wait, they are more than welcome to take the enclosed stairs to get out as well. Um, so the signage is there for, for that. There also has to be a two-way communication. Um, so that fire command center in the building can uh, talk to people on the elevator lobby. San Francisco's taken it to a whole nother level. They've put uh, thermostats in the uh, each elevator lobby. So the fire command center, the commanding officer can keep an eye on temperature in uh, each elevator lobby and determine if there's any fire spread to that area. And they've also added um, two way, uh, not two way. They've added video so that they can actually see in to the elevator lobby and some of these are taking them to a whole other level. Um, just confirm, I want to make sure I cover everything that I wanted to talk about here. Uh, now in the fire command center, the chief commanding officer can watch everything about this elevator. He knows uh, the location of every elevator. He knows if the elevator is occupied. Again, they sense the elevators, uh, people in them. He knows what direction of travel the elevator is going in. Um, he knows the status of the power supply, whether we're on a generator or if we're on the uh, main power. Um, and going back to the fire floor, so it will go and take everybody from the fire floor. And once it stops receiving calls from that floor, it does the two floors above and the two floors below. Um, now, on OEOs, the fire department can go into the fire command center and put it into manual operation. Uh, and it will be called uh, by persons at the floor level. And until it uh, evacuates everybody, it keeps doing its thing. Um, the other thing about the lobbies is they have to be able to hold 25% of the, the floor occup uh, occupancy to allow people in there. And, and there's supposed to also be um, room for wheelchairs in there. And um, it's an absolutely amazing uh innovation now because it's it's impossible to get everybody out of these buildings as, we, as we've seen in some of this stuff now in europe they've also taken it to a whole nother level they've got um shoots they put in these these shoots in buildings that you can go to levels and metal door opens and you get in and it's like a sock and everybody evacuates through the building but um the oeo is absolutely the thing of the, fu uh, the future, it's here, but it's the thing of the future. Um, I'm assuming, Mike, by your reply, you guys are already seeing lots of them over there in New York. They're starting to come in in some of the high rise buildings that we're seeing because of the, um, the height of the buildings, you know, 94 floors, 98 floors, where we're putting residential uh, people on the 98th floor of a building in an apartment. The other thing that, um, and I don't know what, if it's just New York or whatever is the stairwell and elevator pressurization to keep the contaminants out. The, the elevator is pressurized so that because we know the, the elevator moves air and so the doors have to have a little um, give to them. So the elevator shaft is now pressurized with an outdoor air source 
that is controlled by a smoke detector and it pressurizes the elevator shaft so that the smoke will not go in, as are the staircases that have to be reachable from the holding area. And our, our, the holding areas are then therefore pressurized because the uh, elevator shaft is pressurized. Absolutely. And the, uh, the other thing is when we talk about putting them in manual, when the fire department puts them in manual, what the elevator does is it uh, is programmed when it's in manual, it goes to the fire floor and then it will respond to signals received based on furthest distance away from the exit of the building. Um, so that's that's the technology that's coming up. Uh, look for it. Look for the uh, fire service access elevators because guys and gals, when we're putting these elevators in phase one and phase two, we're even, you know, everybody thinks we put them in fireman service, we're safe and nothing's ever going to happen. Nothing's further from the truth. Okay, so the elevator industry is doing their best to assist us um, and we keep bringing stuff to the uh, ASME committee, uh, suggestions, and then it's all voted on and the stuff is, you know, a lot of it's got money and politics involved. But this is an absolutely um, fabulous invention, these FSAEs, because it's going to make it a lot safer for us to get in these elevators. And again, remember, you'll know you have them. Building's 120 feet above, uh, lowest grade uh, access of the fire department vehicle. Fire helmet, three inches in height. Uh, whether it's a dark on light or a light on dark background. And um, I think that's all I got, unless any of you guys have any questions for me. I have a question for you, Michael. Yes, sir. Um, because in the city of New York, the fireman service elevators have to be tested by a building employee once a month. Do you know, on the? because I don't know, do you know on these new elevators if there is a testing feature and who does it and when it's supposed to be done? To me, it sounds like it's got to be a mechanic because it's so in depth with all the computers and everything. But I don't know. And I was wondering if you had any idea. The one thing I do know is the OEOs are supposed to have somebody that is answering it live in the uh, whether they're either in the building or wherever they may be. Um, they are supposed to be tested monthly, but I don't know who is required. I would assume also that it's going to have to be uh, more than likely the elevator company that puts these in. Thank you. Mike, I have a question. Do you know off the type of your head for any listeners that want to get some more information, any literature that you could direct them to or any online website or videos that may have some uh, more information on this? Actually, I was just on the internet yesterday. If you just type in, just do a Google search for occupant evacuation elevators, uh, the literature is there. There's some great videos of it. There's a lot of animated videos because of some of the new uh, technology, but uh, Google's our best friend, and also with fire service access elevators as well. Um, get on the Google, uh, look for these articles, and there's some really good videos as well. Hey, Chief, Thank how are you, Chief Alton? Good to see you. I am good. I had to take myself off of mute. I'm actually squatting in uh, Pete Procleo's office. I'm up here in Fairlawn, New Jersey. It's absolutely. Jersey is everything absolutely you could ever imagine it to be today. So, uh, yeah, there we are. Yeah. Good stuff. I was, I was in D.C. Uh, last few days, had a lovely visit up in D.C. As a matter of fact, uh, Ron Sarnicki and Vic Stagnero from the National Fallen Firefighters just left the offices here in Jersey. So uh, we're, we're doing our Christmas party uh, get together here at the office. So it should be a fun evening. We're going to we're going to go we're going to go dine on some fine cuisine here in uh, New Jersey, otherwise known as pizza. So I'm just kidding. Very good. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to the young man next to me here. Oh, jeepers. Uh, hey, hey, it's the brotherhood. As long as we don't get carried away. You know, you know what was fascinating though, that we're talking about elevators. I was in the um, Phoenix Hotel, which is on Capitol Street. It's just off the, our nation's capital, obviously. It's on 504, Cap 540 Capitol Street. It's an old hotel, so it's one of those historic hotels. It was some kind of a rooming house or, or such before it was converted to a hotel. And the elevators were really probably only suitable for you know, five or six civilians. So for firefighters, you might be able to get two or three firefighters in there you know, packed up. But you know, the, 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 types of, um, the types of things that you have to be... Um, aware of and, and 
attuned to when it comes to elevators, as Mike was talking about in a great presentation, are so varied, right? Because these these smaller elevators, you know, you, you couldn't, they're really not usable at all for us. And, and I believe it was only a nine story, you know, building, but nine stories is nine stories. And uh, so it was, it was a fascinating deal. And it even had, um, I don't know how you address this, but right off the elevator, between the two elevator bays actually, was one of those mail drop chutes where you used to go put a postal letter and it would drop down that glass tube and then into the secure mailbox. It's still functional. And uh, it was just it was just fascinating, right, to see the to see how the the building had been adapted to the modern you know necessities of elevator and such, but <clears throat> the, the issues that that could pose in a fire were were, were pretty interesting to me. Um, I, I'm I'm not sure you know how how it was put in, or I didn't get into any of the construction of it. I would have liked to have had more time to do that. But it was a really interesting uh, uh, elevator accommodation that they had, and, and 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 as in many of these buildings that are retrofitted with elevators, some of the floors weren't exactly corresponding to the grade of you know. So you'd kind of get off and you dip down a little bit. So you had you'd have an area where you may have an interesting stratification of smoke. You may have interesting uh, air. Air flows in there, uh, gra air, air, gravity currents, as we used to call them back in the old days before they got changed to flow paths. Um, not to confuse people with actual physics, but or science. But um, so it was a really interesting building and an interesting. I, I was thinking about this get together. I was waiting to hear, and uh, uh, I, I apologize for getting on late, but my duties here precluded me. But I, I and I, and before I stop jabbering my my heart is out to the sheridan family and i know you probably said something earlier bill but i'd like to join you with those sympathies to the sheridan family and their loss but sorry I have, i'm going to pose a question to the uh to the panel here uh we're running into buildings high high end oceanfront buildings uh, in our jurisdiction we talk about access stairs uh captain mike and the problem with access stairs that are going between two floors uh, so that the occupants of a business or residence do not have to go use the elevator or use the, uh, the, pu the public stairway. Um, and we know the problem with that. But how about an elevator in an apartment that is three stories in height? Uh, have any of you, because we're running into this now, Elevators within buildings that have their own elevators, like where Chief Halton lives there in Oklahoma. I think he has one of these places like that, his palatial pad. So, does anybody, any, uh, anybody here want to comment on that? It's actually just a stair lift. It's the chair that goes up, but I actually do have one. But the, uh, but it's interesting you said that. My sister in in Franklin, Virginia, the true story has a three-story home, older home, and it actually has a cage-style elevator that's got to be maybe 50 years old. So they exist in private residence as well, but I have seen them in small low-rise buildings. Well, well after the Oakland, I'm sorry, Mike, after the Oakland Hills fire, they re, the average house that they rebuilt uh, was double the square footage, and there was like uh, some record number of permits given out for elevators within the private residence. But I don't have any recollection in our area of people having an elevator just in their own apartment. However, uh, about two weeks ago, I was in a, an apartment fire and uh, just a note on multi-story apartments. We had, it was a two-story apartment, started on the first floor, uh, two stories. When we went up to the, to the, uh, the, the floor above in the hallway, and we often say, you know, look at the floor above to get the layout. I have apartment 201 on one side and then apartment 101 on the second floor because you can enter that apartment from the first floor or the second floor uh, on the same floor. And so if we had, you know, uh, be advised that uh, the floor numbers are not, the or apartment numbers are not always going to correspond to the floor you're on because I think if we had uh, been led up to 101 on the second floor, we could end up, you know, above this thing. Um, 
but yeah, the elevator usage is a, a real interesting uh, topic. Uh, something I was thinking about earlier in the conver- conversation is, uh, and we talked about this in our notes before the show, is uh, non-ambulatory or wheelchair-bound people that, you know, and, and they're going to have to really be dependent on this type of elevator because they can't take the stairs. Now, um, there's two things we can do to help with this is if you're lobby control, we have to ask if, if anybody in that building that we know of, I mean, if someone in, in peril above the fire or on the fire floor, do they know of any occupants that are not ambulatory? And when we do the classes for the buildings to let them know that they need to call the lobby and say, Hey, I'm, I'm in my apartment. I, you know, I have no smoke in my apartment, but I'm not ambulatory and I can't get out. And it also brings up a question of, you know, Clark, with all the hotels that you guys have and, and, and all the turnover of people every couple of days in the room, do the hotels get information about guests? Would they have information that, hey, in these rooms, we basically have some wheelchair-bound people or not ambulatory or anything? Is that something that you could get? No, absolutely not, Daryl. We They do not do that. You're right. We are so busy. There are so many hotels. We have 150,000 hotel rooms in Las Vegas. And they are turning over every two and three days. Um, there is nothing, in, there is no system in place that tracks these type of people. Um, and and we have the same problem that you do, and I'm sure they do in New York and Miami. Is everyone is not everyone speaks English. In fact, 50% of the people in the hotel aren't English speakers. We have people from all over the world. So, in the city of New York, they are required when they rent you a handicap room to ask if you will need help in an emergency to evacuate the hotel room. And every night they are required to print up a list of the rooms because they could rent me or you or anybody on this a handicapped room and say they're fine, but they are required to ask you and have a list at the fire command station of the people who are going to require assistance every night. They have to print up a new list. That's a fantastic idea. I'm gonna ask Mike, He's got a bizarre story about a um, an elevator in a private residence, which I think is going to be very interesting. So here I'm going to hand it back over to Mike. Yeah, we just we just got through talking about you know, new elevator technology and all these fancy elevators. Well, don't forget about what we're talking about here. The residents that have elevators. We had one of our crews went to an older home in the Coral Gables area for a person stuck in an elevator. It seems pretty simple. Well, what happened was they got there, a gentleman was helping move a refrigerator and he got in the elevator first. They pushed the elevator in with him and the elevator fell and got stuck between floors. Well, it was an old, old wooden elevator and it ended up being a long drawn out uh, event. That, uh, the elevator was, I don't even know how many years old. The guys had to cut the top of the elevator off to get in and get the guy because he was pinned between the elevator and the wall and we couldn't move the elevator because the elevator was between floors. So don't start thinking about when you're thinking about elevators, remember there's old ones. Um, and in residences, you're going to come across these elevators and also a new one that you're going to start seeing. Uh, and I'm, I've been getting a lot of phone calls from guys asking me if I've seen it. Uh, they have these new pneumatic elevators that they're putting in these residences. And it's like, it works under the same theory of, when you used to go to the bank teller and it sucked the tube up through it, it's basically the, the, the same thing. And in South Florida, uh, our, our re- private residential elevators, once they're installed, we don't have, they're not covered by the same codes as all other elevators. Nobody goes in and checks them. So if you ever go into a residential house and there's elevator issues, be really very careful with these because you, we have no idea what we're going to run into with them, when the last time they were checked, when the last time they were inspected. Um, so... On top of all the, you know, new technology and everything, don't forget about the older stuff and some of these great stories you guys are telling. Bill, back to you. Hey, we're gonna we're gonna know about the last five minutes, um, and uh, we still gotta give a shout out to our sponsor Key. But uh, I think we'll start with Daryl. Any closing thoughts? Any words of uh, encouragement or words of advice for some of our uh, our viewers, particularly the uh, younger? folks that uh, look the old salty guys like this us for yeah. so daryl if you first, go ahead. first of all uh back to, to 
to the key hose uh, you mentioned earlier about all the different sizes out there and i am uh and, and a lot of other manufacturers are following their lead and i really applaud them for listening to the fire service and making a lot of these changes fire service driven and not industry uh driven you know um they listen to people like dennis Legear and they're making some wonderful stuff I've tried that two and a quarter. I think it's, you know, it's really, really good stuff. Uh, and bringing the construction back to old school uh, stuff is, I think, beneficial for us. So uh, kudos to them. Uh, one thing I we mentioned uh, briefly was people silencing alarms. We cannot tolerate going into a hotel and strobes are going off and the alarm has been silenced or even worse, reset without anyone checking. Um, I report that to our fire prevention bureau right away. I, I ask for the manager and tell them uh, we're giving a false information to the occupants. If you silence this alarm and you do not know that there's not a fire in this building. I learned yesterday, I had never known this, um, that the uh, One Meridian Plaza fire had been giving alarms and being reset and alarms and reset. And it was like the fourth alarm and it really got a head start. And uh, there at times were even canceled. I think we've all probably experienced being canceled because of an alarm. Uh, my former city didn't allow us to be canceled. They just give us information, but um, which I think is a great idea. Just give us some more information, but uh, you shouldn't be allowed to be canceled because the the tenant is telling you it's it's a false alarm and they do not for sure that it's a false alarm. Captain Mike, does FDNY have a policy on uh, the in, the building engineer finds you and says, "Oh yeah, we've got some smoke coming out of an electric meter room on the 13th floor. Here, I'll show you. I'm gonna ride up in the elevator with you." Because I know some departments are very strict about that. They will, uh, they will allow the, um, the building engineer to ride up with them, but we're going to get off following our policies, two, floor, two floors below and walk up. We're going to have the elevator in fireman service, and we're going to go up and we're going to take the engineer with us because he has the keys and he knows where we're going. That's fine, but we are not going to uh, let it um, do, we're not going to let him do anything else. And the other thing, you just asked a question earlier about the young kids. Listen, for all the young kids out there, Merry Christmas. Enjoy your families, your kids, and everything else. But get involved. Read. Go on YouTube and get become a part of the fire service. Chief Thank Hall, you. Merry I know Christmas. you need to leave. Any closing thoughts before you go? No, it was a great conversation. I apologize for coming in late and leaving early. I've got a ton of work here, obviously. I do want to wish everyone a, a Merry Christmas and, and a great uh, a New Year's. Um, I hope all is well in your worlds and with your family and, and on behalf of fire engineering and FDIC and fire operators emergency equipment and firefighter nation and, and GEMS and EMS today. Uh, we, we just want to say thank you for your continued support and, and your kindness to us over the years. And, uh, and to Bill and Mike and Daryl and Mike, who I can't see, I guess he's behind Bill somewhere. Um, thank, you, thank you for a wonderful presentation and, and your friendship and all you do for us. Uh, love you guys and uh, Merry Christmas. Clark. Oh, go ahead, Captain Mike. Do you have something to say? Okay, Clark, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, again, happy holidays to everybody. And uh, we have to know what's in our buildings. And we run, we run EMS calls in these buildings all of the time. Please stop at the fire command center. Just find out in this building what are your capabilities. Here's who we are. Here's what we're going to need when we're in your building. What can you provide us? It's extremely important. You need to not only know what's inside your buildings, but you also need to have a relationship with these people, and they have to understand what we're going to be doing in their, in their building and what information we require when we show up. Thank so, you, Clark. Uh, I want to thank our special guest, Mike Posner. Uh, excellent research. Um, Two people that I uh, I want to recommend that if you ever get the opportunity to attend a class by Captain Posner on elevators, his his trademark one is the ups and downs of elevators, uh, and he can 
do a, an hour class, he can do an eight hour class. And it all depends upon how much information you have, or how much time you have and how much information you can uh, uh, digest. And, and also, uh, how many elevators are available? Maybe none. And he can handle that as well. The other one is Dennis Laguerre. Uh, this guy is a um, highly intelligent uh, brainiac, and I mean that in the, the most complimentary way. That he, I don't know that there's anybody that has a working knowledge of uh, the hose construction and fire stream uh, dynamics, uh, for lack of a better word, than, than Dennis. So I wanted to give a shout out to them. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Key. That's KeyHose.com. And I want to wish all of our viewers here, all of our participants, uh, the happiest holiday, happy, safe, prosperous. And uh, let's remember, when we're with our families, think about the first responders that are not. Think of the firefighters and police officers that are working that day or Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. And think about our people overseas in the military that uh, are protecting us so we can enjoy our 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 very comfortable American lifestyle, and we can have a wonderful time with our friends and families over the holidays. So to everybody out there, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. I just want uh, all of our brothers and sisters listening, uh, when you hit your knees, when you talk to whoever you talk to, keep the Sheridan family and your thoughts and prayers, please. And also in New Jersey, there were uh, four people murdered by two uh, pieces of crap. One of them was a police officer and with five children and three innocent civilians were just murdered. Uh, just think about these people when you hit your knees and uh, keep them a positive thought for all of these folks. And as you said, for all of our military and all of our people who can't be with their families. Thank you. I think we'll see you in the next year. All right. God bless you guys. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful time. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you in uh, January.